just about the percentages of the incidents that's happened last year. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the projectiles was kind of that smaller percentage, but it still seems to be the most important because that's the most lethal out of all of them. But we also have um, burns too, right? You mm -hmm. talked about thermal burns a little bit. Yeah. So can you want to talk about like how people can actually like obtain those? So yeah, burns are, are um, you know, we can only get it when the, the machine's making its noise, right? When we're right. actually performing an acquisition. And that's because of the time varying RF. That we have so those are the, the, the so there's two risks essentially there's the heating up <clears throat> risk right the, and the one main concern of having this heating is causing heat stroke right so we don't want to cause heat stroke in our patient increase the temperature because they're thermally compromised in some way and right. so we set these SAR limits but I am not aware of one incident where a patient has received any type of heat stroke ever in the world right so it doesn't mean that we have to be laxed on this. It's good. That means that we're doing our job and we have the right levels of limits in terms of heating. But when we start talking about burns, um, we can see burns in many different forms. So we see burns from a proximity burn um, where individuals can be placed in a magnet. Um, large patients, we typically see them with obese patients. Mm -hmm. And if their arms are pushed against the sides of the gantry, they're right against that RF transmitter. And so there's rungs of this RF transmitter. And if you're pressed against that within a specific distance, you can develop a dipole-dipole reaction where we get these <coughs> vibrations of, you know, atoms at those areas, kind of like a microwave. Right. And so these individuals can receive these burns, you know, first, second, third degree burns on their arms, shoulders, elbows, whatever's contacting the side there. But it's at isocenter, right? That's where our RF transmitter is located. Right. And then we have induced current loop burns. And you guys can search the MOD database, the FDA MOD database. And I mean, th these are easy to find. They're like the number one. But the one that kind of keeps me up at night is the induced current loop burns, where, you know, a proximity burn, all these are preventable. You put right. a patient in the scanner, you put a pad of 0.5 centimeters to one centimeter between them, make sure it's not a towel because you can't want to get saturated at all. Right. And you're done. You're fine. Do you find that with those burns, they're usually in the elbows and shoulders? Yeah, elbows, shoulders, you know, side of the arm. Right. But the ones that, that scare me is the one that induced current loop burns. Now, you know, picture you're scanning a brain. You put a patient in the scanner, you're doing a brain, everything's fine, and they start screaming. I squeeze that panic ball. And you're immediate, you you're jump, you run in the room, but they get a burn on their calf. Right. They're, they're not exposed to RF. And it's because the electrical fields circulate the patient and start to go down the extremities. And any area where there's a small contact point, skin to skin, oh, right. can produce this burn. And so the thing that scares me the most is you can put a patient in there, put pads separating their legs, make sure their arms, their fingers aren't touching. But what if that pad moves out of place? And they move. I mean, sometimes patients right. scratch their face and then all of a sudden they put their arm down or they touch their hands together. Right. And then this burn happens. And so right. that just is, is communication on top of keeping these um, barriers, um, making sure there's no skin-to-skin -skin contact. As far as safety incidents, what, what percentage do you think that makes up? I think that proximity burns, and from my experience going through the MOD database, I, I looked up like a thousand cases. It was just out of curiosity, because I think we can learn no, from yeah. other people's mistakes. For sure. The majority of them are proximity burns and induced current loop burns. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that everyone like puts so much focus on these implants, right? Right. And so everyone's so nervous about that, you know, uh, whatever, a knee replacement or whatever that is inside them. And, and that doesn't really account for as many of these incidences that we see. And maybe it's because we're doing such a great job. Maybe right. we're just, you know, really cautious. But I kind of want to bring forward a point, all right? So I've got a few instances that I had kind of dealt with um, in the field, and, and we can learn from each other. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of one of those those perfect things where my my experiences can, can teach right. and, and vice versa. That's the best part of MRI right Yeah, there. it is, honestly. And, and I think right. that, the, you know, the smart technologist learns from others' mistakes. They right. don't make them themselves. For sure. And so, you know, I, I, I was a lead for many years. Um, and so I had a lot of techs I was responsible for. So I'd be doing my clerical work and I'd have, um, you know, one tech in particular was a little more laxed. You know, it was that tech's like, I'm busy, I'm running late. So let's get this scan done in half the time and let's stay ahead of schedule, which I think a lot of us kind of fit in that category, which is fine. I mean, we want to stay in time, definitely. Um, but I'll just call him Rick for now. You know, let's just say his name is Rick. And so Rick was bringing back a patient and uh, it was a thoracic spine for um, just general pain. And was this Rick James? No, it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> a different, work, yeah, different work environment. But, um, but, uh, but so uh, he, Rick brought this patient back, and I heard them kind of chatting in the back. It's like, oh, if you had to remove, it's fine. And so I'm like, okay, hey, Rick, I, I need your help. I need your opinion. Can you come over here? And so you know, Rick came over. I said, so, so what, what was removed? So the pacemaker was removed. Okay. Um, so the pacemaker was removed. And he's like, so he's fine. And I'm like, no, what's not fine? Let's just take a peek at an x-ray. What is it? What is it hurt? It's like, man, you're 
over. He's, we got to get going. We're going to be late. You know, I'm like, just it'll take a minute. Let's just look at this x-ray. Yeah. Um, so we're scanning a thoracic spine at a 3T MR unit. And then so we look at an x-ray, and this guy has an abandoned pacing wire in yeah. still. And it, was, it measured 13 centimeters, which is the half wavelength of a 3T. at a yeah. high risk for, right. for a burn at that point. Right. Um, and so, you know, that was my first incident with Rick. And so I said, all right, Rick, um, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, not, let's talk to a rad. Rad canceled the exam. And so, uh, you know, another day with Rick, um, I had, uh, it was five in the morning, right? So early, we start really early. So five in the morning, no resources in the hospital whatsoever. And Rick goes to get a patient, brings the patient back. And I overhear, you know, Rick talking to this patient. I go and talk to him as well, carotid stent. So Rick is like, I gotta cancel this exam. This guy's got a carotid stent. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's pump the brakes. It's five in the morning, let's talk to this guy. Where did you have it done? Who was your physician who put it in? Um, so we got all this information from him. And Rick's like, look, you're gonna kill this guy. You're gonna put him in there, we're gonna burn his neck, and it's gonna be on you. Do you want that? Do you wanna carry that with you? I said, well, if I don't scan him and he's got something going on, I'm gonna have to live with the fact that I didn't give him the care that he needed. Right. Right. And so this guy comes in, I, I look at him, he's, he's twitching, he's got arms, he was in an accident a couple days prior, couldn't really walk, his gait was off, um, a lot of pain down his extremities, couldn't lift his arm real well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, look, let's just spend the extra 15 minutes to see what we can do. If we can't find out, I will call a radiologist and have them make the final call, because right. I can't do that as a technologist, I'm not a physician. Right. So we contact the surgeon. The surgeon says, oh, hey, God, I can pull the chart up. I'm at home. I can pull the chart up. Pulls the chart up. Gives us the carotid stent. We get all the information. I look it up. It's perfectly fine for MR. We scan them. One of the worst cord comps I've ever seen in my life. And so now you ask yourself, if I sent this patient home, because I think I saved his life by not scanning him, but I sent him home with cord comp. Ooh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Would I have really helped this patient? Was I really truly a patient advocate at that point? Right. And I think we need to change the way we think. Instead of thinking the yeah. easy call, right. we're not scanning it. I don't know what it is. Send them away. Right. Let's not do that. Let's actually spend the extra 15 minutes to make sure we're doing our best for that patient. It's actually something we learned um, with Dr. Canal's episode. Um, he really kind of dove into that. It seems like, and I mean, we, we all know who they are, but it seems like there are certain texts. As soon as there's an out, they take it. Right. Exactly. Um, even without investing the time to to try to do the right thing for the patient, which it sounds like that's your experience. So. Yeah. It Kudos is. to you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, there's um, you know, some other thing. I, I one of the, the stories too, I like the the share if you you know if we don't mind is yeah, that yeah, I, I earned the title and it was maybe for a day or two Batman, which which hey. uh, made me feel good. So, <laughs> of all the titles, that's not a bad that's one. A good one. <laughs> and so essentially it was it was a little um, beyond just normal detective work. So a patient um, was on, on the unit, needed an MRI of the pelvis, had a history of uh, cancer, bone cancer. She was 18 years old, ended up having surgery when she was 12. Um, had her femur, part of her femur removed, and a femur rotting. So it wasn't Rick. I don't work with Rick anymore. Um, it was a different technologist. And, and it was an honest thing. We scan femur rottings all the time. We scan joint replacements all the time. But something about this case stood out to me. And, and it was the fact that she was 18. And it was the fact that she had the surgery when she was 12. And so my thought is, well, if they're going to do surgery, most likely they're going to put in magnetically activated rod in her. So I'm like, let's just look at an x-ray. I looked at the x-ray, and yes, it was one of those magnetically activated femur rottings. Right. And so we had them look it up and research, and it was MR unsafe. But it's one of those situations where, you know, we scan femur rottings all the time. All the time. But situationally, it just didn't, it didn't, it just had a red flag. Right. You know? Right. And it's that a little bit of awareness. You're like, yeah. oh, she could have had that when she was 12 years old. Oh, it might have a magnet. You know, it's that awareness that really makes the difference between an incident happening and an incident not happening. Preventing you know? it, yeah. Yeah. It's, man. And then how do you gain that experience? It's training, right? It's training. You gotta get the training. Education. Education. Education.